Welcome to this design doctor. This is uh, for the Reanimator Apothecary subclass. This is from the Dungeon Dudes third party book, Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim. The Apothecary is a custom class that they made for 5th edition, while the Reanimator is a subclass in that. This design doctor is going to be breaking down a little bit more about the subclass, understanding the design, where it goes right, where it goes wrong, maybe some pain points, and maybe some ways that we can learn as designers and some ways that we could iron out the design. So let's start with the fantasy. What is a reanimator apothecary? I think the big contrast here is you have the necromancer wizard who is focused on summoning hordes of undead that are completely mindless. The reanimator apothecary, in contrast, is much more focused on science rather than imbuing necromantic energies into creatures. Instead, they're focusing on visceral processes like vivisection, chemical conditioning, electricity, building one singular undead. Oftentimes you have a singular undead that, that you're going to have an evolving relationship with, that perhaps it's a close family member or a close friend, or perhaps it's a uh, monster that you have created basically from scratch, from parts that you've created and gained mastery over life and death. I think part of the fantasy that we're looking at is the build-your-own-monster aspect to it. If you look at the Magic the Gathering setting in Estrad, they have a set of zombies known as scabs that have all kinds of weird stuff bolted onto them. If you just want to throw on some wings, go for it. If you want to take away a hand and replace it with a hook, go for it. Some scabs don't need a head, and that's totally fine because this is using the human body as a machine, as an instrument, as to whatever you want to do. We're going to look at some examples in fiction. I think the Ur example is Frankenstein, especially from the 1930. 1931 film, uh, and we also look at Herbert West. A lot of the Dungeon Dudes subclasses have been inspired by works of Lovecraft, and Herbert West is himself kind of a parody of uh, Frankenstein, but uh, it's definitely uh, this, this idea of bringing back the dead through science. We look at Dr. Hogback from One Piece. He's particularly a character that has a special relationship with one particular undead, and we're going to put a pin in this, but later I am going to look at Isaac from Castlevania. He does summon hordes of undead, but he has a special moment with one of the demons that he summons. When we look at mechanics of 5e that support this fantasy, certainly what we're looking at for a class is definitely going to be the Apothecary. The Apothecary is a Mad Doctor class, and so a reanimator would fit right in alongside the others. As far as mechanics go, a, an Apothecary is very similar to a Warlock in that they have spell slots that are always of the highest level, and whenever you get a short rest, you'll be able to get back all your spell slots. They have more spell slots than the Warlock, but they don't have Eldritch Blast to fall back on. It is a rather powerful class, so there's a lot of spells that fit this theme of uh, bringing back the dead. Spells that are already on the Apothecary list, like Spare the Dying, Revivify, Speak with Dead, Raise Dead, Finger of Death. Apothecaries also all get a special spell list of uh, two spells of each spell level from first through fifth that is always going to be prepared for them. So that's a good chance to get other spells that aren't on the Apothecary list, like Animate Dead. Now, Animate Dead is a little broken with Apothecary casting, so we will review that briefly. Other spells like Call Lightning and Lightning Bolt, I'm also going to make a special mention of here that will definitely tie back into the subclass design. As far as existing mechanics, there are five pet subclasses in 5e where you can expend a resource like a first level spell slot, or in the case of Druid, a wild shape, where you can get a templated, uh, a templated creature that is just going to always be able to help you out. You're going to use your bonus action to command it, and it's going to help you out. The other things that reanimators might look, like, might look at might be the medicine, medicine skill or abilities that might let you customize your creature that's going to give them small uh, bonuses. These are some of the design aspects that we can look back to when designing a reanimator apothecary. If you want to look at the Dungeon Dudes version, read it over. Feel free to pause the video right here and read this over. Uh, it's got its regular features, first through 18th level, as well as the stat block right here. When I jump into this design, I think the first thing we want to look at is the Corpse Art creature itself. It compares rather favorably to other pets. The HP and AC and the stats, those are all comparable to what already exists. And also, all these sub pet subclasses all have a unique feature. So, for instance, the Wildfire Druid can use its action to teleport itself and its allies and do damage to creatures uh, that it teleported away from. Um, the uh, Every single... Of, of the pet subclasses has something special that it does right when you get it at third level, except for the Corpse Art creature. 
Now, it does have something special, and that's lightning absorption. It's immune to poison damage, immune to lightning, immune to the poison condition. And if it would take poison damage, it's instead going to regain HP. Now, this is very strong, very strong, especially considering that if you take, if you have the Shocking Grasp cantrip, you can just deal lightning damage as a cantrip for free and recharge it indefinitely between fights. And that means that this Corpse Art creature is going to have much longer longevity than longevity than any other uh, of the subclasses, uh, sub, uh, the, the pets, I should say. Um, so, for instance, imagine you're a Drake Warden Ranger. You summon your Drake. It lasts for two combats, and then instead you got to summon, you got to resummon it. Instead, with the Corpse Art creature, you can just charge it back to full with Spark, spark of Life between combats. Now, um, the Battlesmith Artificer, they also get to recharge their pet, but that's using the Mending Cantrip, which costs, which takes one minute instead of one action, like the Shocking Grabs Cantrip. So potentially, you may need to take. 10 minutes to, to get your um, your artificial creation all the way back to full, which might, might 10 minutes versus one minute is, is a significant difference, I would say. Not to mention that um, mending, uh, artificers don't have too many cantrips, so you are deliberately taking the mending cantrip. Uh, it does mean that you may have to forego some other cantrips to, 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 to get that. Meanwhile, the reanimated apothecary, as we're going to see at first level, is just going to get that for free. Now, there are some... I guess we could say drawbacks to this. The Corpse Star creature only comes back one minute later, while all other sub pet subclasses come back in one action when you spend the action. It requires suitable materials, which could be a, a serious nerf if your DM is kind of vindictive. And also, because you are a warlock style caster, the spell slot you're spending to summon is higher, right? So if you are a seventh level apothecary, you're spending a fourth level spell slot to get back your creature, while a seventh level Drake Warden Ranger is only spending a first level spell slot. So that, that is a d distinction. However, you could just take a short rest and get that spell slot back. That's not something that the Drake Warden could do. So that is uh, something to uh, take note of. So if I had to make a comparison, it is a little plain, right? There's nothing really interesting going on here, except for that lightning absorption. And that's effectively just going to mean a lot, uh, a lot more HP, a lot more lang uh, longevity. So this is this is basically a good use for your bonus action. Where you can use a bonus action to have the creature take an action. That's pretty good. You know, it could take an action to pull a lever or grapple somebody and, and push them into the area of one of your spells, or take an action to help you out outside of combat. Which is uh, as a bonus action feels. This is a good use of a bonus action. And this, and the creature itself kind of serves as like an HP battery. It's just going to show up, um, kind of take up a bit of space on the board, and it's just going to take tank some attacks, draw some attacks to itself, uh, not, not with any special abilities, just by, just by incidentally being next to another creature. Um, and that's, that's fine, I guess, at, at third level. There's no customization, but that's okay. We, this is still third level, so we can kind of move on. Uh, for our spell list... We're going to see that it's going to get uh, for free at 6th level. Or you're going to get Animate Dead once per day once per day, and Speak with Dead uh, once per short rest. And also at 1st level, you're going to get Shocking Grasp and Stare the Dying. And once you start looking at this, uh, with these 10 spells, 2 cantrips, and 2 bonus spells, that's 14 spells total, 11 of them are already on the Apothecary list. This is a strong list in general. Uh, these, these are strong spells, so it, you can think of them as free preparations, and I don't know if I would switch them out necessarily, but it, it is a bit disappointing that all of them, you're not getting too much unique stuff. Uh, one of the most uh, notable things here is Lightning Bolt, which with it, you're, it's, it works very good with Apothecary Casting because every time you get a short rest, you're getting all those spell slots back. So right at fifth level, if you want to throw out three Lightning Bolts and then take a short rest and throw out three more, six Lightning Bolts in one day, that's going to tear through a lot of opponents, and you're going to hit your own creature and heal your creature back up. So this is pretty darn effective, and you could easily chew through the rest of your spell slots for the rest of the campaign just spamming Lightning Bolt, uh, and you would probably feel pretty good about it. Um, uh, just to explain some of these spells that are new to the, to the book, so for instance, Invigorate works similar to Aid in that you're going to, but instead, while Aid just increases your um, HP, uh, Invigorate is going to give you temp HP. It also only lasts one hour, which uh, with all that said, I, I think it's basically useless. Uh, you might use it, I, I suppose, if you really want to hand out some extra temp HP. Everybody needs a bit. The The numbers are okay. It's just the, the practical application of temp HP that only lasts an hour is not that practical. 
Corpse Explosion is when you see a creature die, as a reaction, you can cast this spell and it will blow up and do like a little fireball type effect, except it's, you know, deck save, 10 foot radius, 8 die 8 damage. That's really great. Damage as a reaction sounds awesome. Unfortunately, oftentimes it, it will be your ally that just killed something, so that you're, you're about to hit your ally with this damage as well. Um, maybe your ally's ranged, so maybe it's all right. Maybe you don't have that problem. But in general, this is situationally pretty... Pretty powerful. You could, again, chew through your spell slots pretty easily with this. And Nerve Gas is a 10-minute concentration, 10-foot radius fog that just sits around. Any creature that starts its turn there or enters there is going to make an in save or take 3d6 psychic damage and be stunned. A persistent stun effect fog. This is pretty great. And the Corpse Star creature might be able to grab uh, enemies and push them into the fog. Seems pretty good. So overall, I would say the spell list generally fits. you got some strong options. But this is not dramatically um this is not dramatically improving the uh flavor it's it's not it's not injecting a lot of flavor it's not dramatically improving the power not to say it's a bad list and um i'm even going to explore some substitutions later on of my own and uh, i don't really have too many more suggestions of, of ways they could go anyway so i'm, I'm this is this is fine but i don't want to give an impression that it's bad However, at 6th level, I, I can't say the same for the 6th level feature, because you have two features here. The first one is Bodyguard, which is whenever you get hit, if your Corpse Star creature is within 5 feet of the attacker, it can make one attack as a reaction. You can also expend an Apothecary slot and, get one, uh, an and cast Animated Dead once per day. This is a nice uh, workaround, because normally Animate Dead, if you were to put it on the Apothecary spell list, if you're a ninth level Apothecary, you're going to spend one of your 4... 5th level spell slots to create 5 zombies. You're, you're going to do that 4 times at ninth level and create 20 zombies. You're going to rest for 1 hour, you get all your spell slots back, you get tw another 20, and then another 20. And uh, by 12 noon, you've, it's 4 hours since you woke up, you have 80 zombies that you can just do whatever you want with for the rest of your day. Which uh, feels pretty broken. Um, uh, I think anybody could agree. So the, the fact that limiting it to once per day is much more fair. But to get back to the bodyguard damage itself, this is really pushing you as an Apothecary to get up into melee and stay close to your Corpse Star creature to get this bonus damage. And I think that's a little unintuitive because the I, I feel like the default play style for this Apothecary would be you hang back and send your Corpse Star creature in, you hit enemies with Lightning Bolt, and you're also going to heal your Corpse Star creature with that. In this case, if you play that way, you're never going to get to use Bodyguard ever. Unless somebody within five feet of your Corpse Star creature is going to make a ranged attack against you, they're going to make that ranged attack with disadvantage because the Corpse Star creature is within five feet of them. And of course, whenever you have a hostile creature within five feet of you, uh, then you're going to have disadvantage on that attack. And so while the overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage is good, the main bodyguard feature probably is just not going to come up very much. Or it's pushing you into a playstyle that maybe isn't isn't great. Maybe it's not what you want to do, not what you envisioned. And uh, the other feature that you get here is reanimated head, which is similar to in the Herbert West movie where he reanimated the head of his professor. What you're going to get here is reliable talent with Arcana and Investigation. I don't like reliable talent. It is a feature that... Well, part of 5e is the the idea is that if you made somebody make a roll, then there's potentially a good outcome or a bad outcome. And with Reliable Talent, you've basically just erased any kind of bad outcome. So either the DM has to start setting DCs incredibly high for your check to even matter, or you should just not call for the check. And that's especially true for investigation and arcana checks. If the player is investigating and they're interested in what is next, what's the next clue... Um, if, if they're real, rolling Arcana, they want to know lore about your world, they're trying to learn about your world, and you, the DM, you should probably want to tell them, why are you having them roll at all? Just tell them. You know, you'll enjoy it, they'll enjoy it, and you don't have to worry about rolling. Uh, reliable talent, in general, I feel is particularly bad with stealth, perception, persuasion, deception. Uh, Arcana investigation is not so bad, because you probably should have just been telling your players things anyway. So this is an, off an offensive ability. Um, that, but at the same time, it's it's just not much. And you also get one free uh, one free speak with dead uh, once per short rest. It should be once per short rest, not once per day. Uh, again, with speak with dead, oftentimes you can just pick up the head of a creature and go someplace where you're safe to take a short rest. And you can in, instead of spending one minute to cast speak with dead, you can spend one hour. You, you can I should say you can sp cast speak with dead, and then 
uh, take a short rest, and you get that spell slot back immediately. So you're pretty much already casting Speak with Dead for free. So getting it for free here is nothing, nothing, nothing too impactful. Uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, when you're playing this in a campaign. Count the times that this comes up and is super impactful. Where you had to cast Speak with Dead in one minute, you didn't have one hour. You couldn't save the the head for later. And uh, when when everybody's ready for a long rest, um, count the number of times this comes up. I imagine it, it won't come up too often. And this is all that you're counting on from third and sixth level features. The next feature you're getting at tenth level, the campaign's almost already over. And this is all that you've gotten so far. You have a HP battery, uh, a sack of HP that attacks once as your corpse star creature, and you have your regular apothecary spells, which apothecary is a solid class. You're going to get your esoteric theories. It's going to let you build what you want to build. But I think the core fantasy, we haven't really achieved it. So once we get to tenth level, what do we get? Well, it becomes large. We get a speed increase. It gets a chance to grapple. These are nice boosts. But it's not straight boosts. For instance, the creature, now that it's large, there might be places that it just can't go anymore. So uh, that's it's not necessarily a, a strict improvement. Also, large creatures, uh, when they're large, they are taking up more space on the battlefield. But creatures that are small can move through a large creature's space without any penalty. So it's no longer obstructing those foes. And that's going to be especially problematic once we get to 18th level. But that's just something to keep in mind here. As far as grappling goes, okay, nice, let's grapple, but let's also keep in mind that maybe you had a 65% chance to hit, you, you can only grapple once you hit, and to, to pass the grapple, you do have proficiency bonus um, to, to your athletics check, so you maybe have, what, a 65% chance to grapple? That means 65 and 65, you only have a about a 36 to 40% to chance of actually make, making both, hit, both hitting the attack and making the grapple which means only two out of every five hits, maybe one out of every three hits, is when you're actually going to grapple. Now, this is going to get better at 14th level, but I, I, I don't know if this is a very impactful feature. It is good with, like I said, nerve gas and with other things that you can grapple your opponents and, and pull them in. It means you'll be able to hit the opponent with lightning bolts more easily because now you can have the corpse star creature grapple them and move them into a line with even another creature. So this isn't bad, but it's also a bit situational. I don't know why there's a DC to escape this grapple. You know, players don't have that. I guess monsters in the monster manual do, but you'd think you could just make a regular opposed check as you normally do. 14th level, you are, be, by getting an extra attack, I, I will remind you that this is still 1d4 plus 4 damage. This is an average of 8.5 damage if you hit. So once you calculate the chances to actually hit, this is like 6 damage, 6 extra damage that you're getting here, bonus which is fine, and you also are getting the grapple chance is increased. So this is a fine feature, but this is nothing to go crazy for. And at 18th level, it becomes huge. This is, again, problematic. Medium creatures can now just walk through its square with no problem. There will be places that it just can't go because it, it's going to have to squeeze. You gain that reach of 10 feet. It, you, and the fact that you also are required suitable materials... I could see a very vindictive DM being like, well, your corpse star creature got hit by lava, or it went over a waterfall, or it's lost on the ethereal plane or the astral sea or whatever. And now you need a huge amount of flesh to build it again. That can be brutal. And it just means that uh, your, your DM is saying, oh, yeah, you know that subclass feature, the core feature that makes your subclass what it is? No, you just, you just can't use that. That's not allowed in this case. And that just feels really bad. The reach bonus is good. The speed increase is good. The bonus damage is good. And the uh, push, lift, or drag um, and, and, and carry is a utility feature. You know, sometimes it, it, it might come up. But in general, this is, this is not something that I'm blown away by. If I had to make a summary of the subclass, I'd say you have a solid core. The theme is tight. The mechanics are good. The, the, the pet... Being a corpse star creature, being a uh, creature made of flesh, an undead abomination, that works. Those mechanics work, but you need pizzazz. Creating the monster on its own is fun, but there's no co customizability, and there's not really a coherent play style. You don't really have the option of, what if I want to hang back and send my creature in? Or what if I want to be up with my creature is there any kind of other bonuses that I can get that, that are really going to reinforce that? Or what if 
me and my creature both wanted to hang out in the back lines. Well, your creature only has a melee attack, so that's not really going to work. There's not really a coherent playstyle that you can build. And I think there's some ways that you could tighten up some pain points. So, for instance, there are departures from the templates in that it's going to cost uh, a more expensive spell slot. Well, I, that is something that we can live with. But the fact that it's going to cost one minute and that it requires suitable materials, those can be problematic. Making it large and then huge... Uh, it also kind of betrays the fantasy a bit. What if this is a corpse art creature that you have a, a close relationship for a long time, and uh, now suddenly you're being forced by the game mechanics to make your creature into something that you don't want it to be? Uh, I think that's a little unfair. Um, so I think there are good ideas here, but there are secret limitations. When we look at the design doctor, I want to grab onto a few ideas that I want to improve this uh, this design with. One is that I want it to be customizable. I want the creature to be customizable, but I also want your build and play style to be customizable, as I was just mentioning. I love mechanics that tell a story, so I'm very interested in putting in some mechanics that are going to power up the creature, but they're also going to tell a story in and of themselves. With that, let's look at a new spell list. One flip that I considered making was flipping out Inflict Wounds for uh, Witch Bolt. Inflict Wounds is not a very good spell. It's melee, it's 3 die 10, necrotic damage. It scales with 1d10, and uh, Witch Bolt is not notoriously even worse. It's one of the worst spells in the game. I don't know if I would ca cast Inflict Wounds, and Witch Bolt might be worth it to charge up a Corpse Art creature, but at that point, you could just kill the Corpse Art creature and bring it back with an action. You know, just drown the Corpse Art creature, do something that's not going to uh, ruin it, but it's going to reduce its HP to zero, and then spend a spell slot to bring it back. And you know, that being said, um, it, that does feel kind of cheesy, and you, you would kind of prefer a way to charge it up with a changed lightning, with you know, even with the changed lightning absorption I'm going to make. So, Witch Bolt might actually be a solid consideration here. But the main things that I want to call out here are at third level, I changed up the the core features. So we're going to put Speak with Dead on the spell list instead of Revivify. Revivify is a little too clean for me. Um, not 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 really necessary. And at fifth level, we've also ta taken off Raise Dead. That's another kind of a, a clean looking reanimation that you probably wouldn't expect from a reanimator to just bring you back and you're just normal. You're, you're, you are how you were before. And Raise Dead is actually pretty bad as, as an apothecary preparation because the number of days that you'll need it is so rare. Because oftentimes, if you'll find a body, you can just. Uh, take a long rest and prepare Raise Dead the next day because uh, Apothecaries are prepared casters. Uh, if there's ever a circumstance where today is the 10th day, we need to cast Raise Dead today, then you can just cast Gentle Repose on them and that will let you cast Raise Dead on them the next day. So Raise Dead is an easy, it's easy to take it off the spell list with, with no consequence really. So what I did want to call out is the things that I did on here. add on here. Speak with Dead, because I took it off, out of the ability, Speak with Dead is going to be here. Call Lightning. Now, I feel Call Lightning works a lot better than Lightning Bolt. It works better with Apothecary Casting in that you don't need to keep eating up your spell slots. for You don't have to just spam Lightning Bolt. Um, you can cast Call Lightning once while you're in combat, and then you'll still have spell slots for when you're out of combat, or maybe when Call Lightning goes down, or maybe if you need to do something else in combat, you'll still have that. Call Lightning works great with the Apothecary as Action Economy, where you can cast Call Lightning as an action, and that's going to hit your Corpse Art creature and deal damage to somebody else, and it's going to... You're, you still have your bonus action free to command your Corpse Art creature. It also works with the flavor of it. Uh, when we think of Frankenstein, his original creature, or perhaps the 2015 <laughs> Victor Frankenstein, it's always like uh, we're, we're in Rooftop Storm in this Magic the Gathering card. It's always, oh, glory, raise the weather vane. It's this idea that the storm is already there. You, you have to call it, right? It's, it's not something that you have a machine that you're shooting out lightning. Instead, you're calling down lightning from the heavens to empower your creature. It also has some interesting limitations. Like if you're in the sewer, you're underground, you're in some place that doesn't have lightning, what are you going to do? That's kind of an interesting question, and it kind of builds some interesting and fun gameplay elements into the loop right there. The last thing I added here is a spell called Awaken. That's a secret that we're going to talk about uh, later. So Spark of Life, Shock and Grasp, and Spare the Dying, we can just leave that on there. I like this templating here that you gain proficiency in a skill. If you already have the proficiency, you gain expertise in it. This is a good tiered system where it's not just giving expertise with no investment, uh, it, it's it got some player choice here, and if so, if you already have medicine, you get a bonus, 
Uh, and so it's 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 just I think this is just a no brainer as far as designing um, expertise goes. Uh, one thing here, I, I always felt that the Herbert West Lovecraft stories, those are a little more low fantasy, low magic. I think it's fine to have a uh, a grotesque uh, head, living head, right at first level as just a flavor feature. It just shows up, and if you want to use it, you can. And if you don't, that's fine too. And it's just a flavor feature at first level, low magic, right from word go. This is fine, I think. And so at third level, we're going to iron out all the irregularities in the, in the stat block. For instance, we're getting rid of the text about suitable materials just to avoid the vindictive DM. We are going to be able to come back with one action. That's totally fine, especially considering that our apothecary spell slot that we're expending is so much higher. And we're also I'm also going to put bodyguard right into the stat block because other creatures have special actions or reactions they can do. I'm going to put Bodyguard right in the stat block, and instead of whenever you get hit, the the Bodyguard can, the Corpse Art creature can make one attack, instead it's going to say whenever any creature within five feet of the Corpse Art creature is targeted with an attack, the Corpse Art creature can use its reaction to be the target instead. This is, uh, really plays into the HP battery nature of it, where now it can protect your allies, or if you're there, it can protect you too, and it also functions more like a bodyguard that you're jumping in front of like, Mr. President get down where you get to jump in front of the bullet right and lightning absorption because I thought the cantrip was too powerful I just decided to say whenever the corpse creature would take lightning damage not from a cantrip it instead regains each HP equal to half the damage that would have been dealt I did I crunched a couple numbers on as to where this should land but this was the number that I finally landed on where your lightning absorption is not going over the top but you are going to be able to recharge it fully if you use your apothecary spell slot to cast call lightning I think this is I think this is a good middle ground for what you want this ability to be it's not infinite HP it's using your spell slots to give the creature HP back and that works very well with bodyguard because now it's taking more attacks and so with the with bodyguard gone from put right into the stat block and with the head just turned into a flavor feature what do you get at 6 level this brand new feature that i came up with so this is this is the customizability that i was wanting so much this is cadaver crafter here we are going to include the once per day animate dead with basically the same text as it was before but also you're going to be able to add some customizability to your corpse art creature but also whenever you summon animate dead you know whenever you cast animate dead summon undead or if you get create undead or dance macabre uh, I, I believe those aren't technically on the apothecary spell list because of SRD shenanigans but potentially you could get them in your in your game you just talk with your DM it should be fine uh, then you're going to be able to give them bonuses this was something that I was influenced by the necromancy wizard in that I did not want any of the options to be stronger than the necromancy wizard but I wanted them to be comparable and I wanted to make some interesting build decisions so one of them was to share melee with the corpse heart creature you could just take deadly where the corpse heart creature is going to get more damage you could give it sturdy where it's going to get more HP and so that way it's going to be able to tank more attacks grasping limbs this is the 10th level feature moved it down so that you can already start to make grapple plays this early on these are all viable for sharing melee with the creature. Or you could use the projectile. So now it's got the throne property. This works similar to uh, when it says in the monster manual, creatures with the throne property, they're presumed to have the ammunition. And you can flavor it however you like. And the idea is that by giving it the throne property, you still get to use strength. The damage type is still the same. And you get to just, in this short little blurb, you immediately get give it an ability that people understand. Uh, the only confusion, I guess, would be the ammunition, which I would say... Just they just have infinite ammunition, and you can just flavor it however you however you like. Um, would would be my intent as the designer. But this would be the idea that you get to stay in the back with your corpse art creature. You're hucking stuff while the corpse art creature is hucking stuff with its projectile. You're both in the back, and if anybody targets you, then the corpse art creature can use its reaction to become the target of the attack instead, and it's going to be able to protect you back there. And uh, even if, you know, if anybody closes, likewise, yeah, it can, it can become the target of those attacks. And the, and I think the most, the most, uh, the, the default play style that, that I think people would gravitate towards would be you hang in the back while the course our creature grapples opponents, pulls them into your spells, pulls them into your call lightning, or pulls them into whatever permanent spell you want to hang out in like nerve, nerve gas or cloud kill and the corpse our creature is going to be, you're going to be in the back while the corpse our creature is in the front. I think this is, this is 
got the versatility I want. It's got the customizability I want. This I, I'm pretty satisfied with landing on this as a cadaver crafter. And none of this is overpowered. This is none of this is as powerful as the Necromancy Wizards feature. The deadly that I finally landed on 1d6 is comparable to the Necromancy Wizard in that they add your proficiency bonus, so it's going to start at plus three and go to plus four. And of course, 1d6 is 3.5 on average. Um, and so I I just thought that was I just thought that, uh, that that's about where the math wanted to go. Um, so, 10th level feature, this is a new feature that I added as well. So the first thing that we're going to look at is, the most of this is identical, it's going to, it can get a speed of 40 feet, and then when you create it, you can have it be small or large, or medium. And that immediately gets rid of the problems of, well, I don't want it to be large, I want it to stay the same as, as it was, either because of squeezing or because of the roleplay involved. And here, we're going to look at Awaken. The Awaken spell, you get to target a creature, and it's charmed by you for 30 days. If, if it had a poor intelligence, it, that intelligence suddenly becomes 10, and it can speak. And being, being able to use humanoid brains instead of diamonds? Great, great flavor. And uh, that's something that definitely tied into in... Uh, one piece, um, Dr. Hogback was able to turn all kinds of stuff into zombies. The carpet was a zombie. The uh, boar's head that was on the mantelpiece was a zombie. And all of them could talk. All of them could speak. All of them had uh, had, had intelligence. Um, suits of armor could be zombies. Anything could be a zombie. Uh, and, and in this case, by making it undead or constructs, the Corsair creature is a construct. And... Uh, so th this is going to boost its intelligence from 8 up to 10, so it's a pretty small boost, but the key feature is that it gets intelligence of its own, and it gets a chance for you to interact with it and roleplay with it. In Castlevania, um, Isaac talks to Fly Eyes, which is this demon, and this is the only demon that talks, and as he talks with it, he starts to gain a perspective as to what it is, like what is its opinion of the world, what is its opinion of being in service to him, and how that uh, being part of hell, uh, it's, it's also subject to the... Uh, the unjust whims of heaven is is another perspective that it has. And there's so much that you could learn from a, a creature that talks. I go back to the original Frankenstein, where Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein's monster, I should say, has its own perspective on the world. It has its own desires. It's It's been cast off by its creator, and it's alone in this world. And all this you can get from this Awaken. Otherwise, the Corpse Art creature is just hanging out, can't talk, it's just a big monster, it's kind of scary. The idea of bringing, of a necromancer bringing back something and it's intelligent. Also, it doesn't necessarily have to have its own mind. Maybe uh, incorporating all these other brains have, have something, a totally new consciousness has emerged. I think of the movie of Frankenstein where a brain of a criminal was used and yet Frankenstein's monster had an almost innocent, childlike um uh, demeanor. This is just a really cool feature that I really liked. It's it's not a, a super big powerful feature, but I think this is going to make the player feel important. It's going to make them feel good. It's going to and you can make some some niche plays with this. For instance, if you could capture an undead uh, alive or unalive in this case, strap it to a table and pump it full of brains, now all of a sudden, oh, hey, you know, now I have a Bodak, that's my ally. And that's kind of cool. That's, I mean, it's very niche, it's going to cost a lot of money, but go for it, man. Like, that's that's exactly what we want from a reanimator, I think. This is not a huge power boost, It's it's but it fits perfectly with the uh, spells on the on the subclass table. It's it, I felt that this was just a home run. At level 14, we again get the extra attack, but I also wanted to add more customizability, so... How about a fly speed? Okay, awesome. And now that it's large, it can serve as like a dragon. It's going to carry my party around. Weakening grip. Um, this has a bunch of limitations, like it's on your turn. Uh, creatures grappled by your corpse or creature have disadvantage on saving throws against your apothecary spells you cast. So it's only on the apothecary spells, and it's on your turn. So the corpse or creature acts immediately after you, so you're going to use your turn, then you're going to command your corpse or creature to grapple somebody, and then next turn you're finally going to get that payoff. This is very strong to give disadvantage on saving throws, especially when apothecaries have such good spells, but it's only on your turn, so if, if it's like hold monster, on their repeat saving throws, it's most often going to be on their turn. So this is not, I, I think this is a exactly where you want the power to be. Very strong, when you pull it off it's going to feel awesome, but it doesn't, you're probably not going to pull it off too often. And Toxic Breath, this is borrowed pretty much verbatim from the Drake Warden Ranger. The big difference being it's poison or necrotic damage and a con save instead of dexterity save. And you're using your Apothecary spell slots to, to recharge it. This is just, again, a, a, just a fun feature. to uh, uh, It's going to deal a lot of damage. And the 18th level uh, ability remains very much the same. If you, uh, For those with a 
keen eye, they could spot that Cadaver Crafter had all those abilities that were originally in I Can't Stop the Monster I Created. Uh, we're also going to get to get, get that reach of 10 feet, speed by 50 feet, any small, size smaller than Gargantuan. Great. Uh, you know, now now if you want it to be the huge building wrecking thing, awesome. But if you want it to be tiny, you know, put it in a, a crate and mail it to your enemies and then have it pop out and breathe toxic breath on their castle. Uh, that's cool. That's really cool, too, I think. I, I wanted this di design to poke holes in where I saw the limitations of the original design. And I wanted to iron out those pain points. I wanted to tighten up the finicky bits. I wanted to build a coherent play style. I wanted to make the subclass more interesting and exciting to play. I hope I've accomplished that. And that's the whole point of these Design Doctor um, series, is to crack this open, take a look at it, what, what it looks like, uh, understand it, become a master of uh, the dead subclass, and bring it back to life. And isn't that what being a reanimator is all about?